Hey, so I'm Joseph, and this is the second part of Chapter 5 of Stuart's Calculus, and we're going to be talking about um, volume using the revolution method. So, in calculus, so by the end of this video, you will be able to find the volume generated by taking a curve and basically spinning it around one axis, and the volume of that solid that's generated, you will be able to find what that volume is. So, before we do that, um, let's just think generally about volume. So, one of the most common um, things that we, we, we've, we've been taking the volume of since geometry is the cylinder. And the way we think about a cylinder's volume um, is in this way. So we look at the solid cylinder and say, okay, we've got two measurements. We've got the radius of the base and we've got the height. And then we take it for granted. Um, we take this volume equation for granted that the volume is equal to pi r squared h. However, we can look at this volume in a different way, and we can kind of, we'll get to the same volume equation, but we can think about it differently. So now imagine you slice this up into multiple slices. If you were to take out one of these slices and look at it um, straight on, it would basically just be a circle like this. It would, um, and it would have a radius. And now the area of that circle is called the cross-sectional area. And it's the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. And that is, we can just call it A, and that will be pi r squared. Oh, that's a little r. Pi r squared. And that's the area of a circle. So that's this cross-sectional area. Now, let's take this to um, a Cartesian plane. And how could we conceptualize this even a little bit differently? Well, we've got a rectangle, and this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is some rectangle in the Cartesian plane. Now should we s imagine that the x-axis is a rod, and this is a rectangle coming off of it. Should we spin the x-axis, what shape would we get here? We would get a cylinder. And we'd have those little cross sections, those circular cross sections, if we cut it up. And this y value right here, that y value corresponds to the radius. And so we'd be able to find, if we were to find the radius, find that cross sectional area, and add up all the different cross sections um, across this height dimension, we would be able to find the volume of that cylinder and we'd get the same equation. Well, what, it, what we would actually be doing is since these cross sections, we could make them teeny, teeny, tiny, so they're basically just flat circles, take a limit, and we can actually, in it, if we find one of these cross sections, we can integrate them over an interval a, b to find the, the volume. So, we've got the cross sectional area as pi this r is actually, if we call this line right here some function, some function of x, that r corresponds to a y value. So that would be pi function of x squared, and that's the cross-sectional area. If we wanted to find the volume, we just have to add all those little cross-sections, in other words, integrate over some interval a, b, and that would get us the height component. So the integral from a to b of pi f of x squared dx. And that is another way of getting the volume of a cylinder if we're finding it based on um, some straight line in a Cartesian plane. Now we can generalize this to find the volume of any function rotated around actually either axis. Um, so let's, let's look at that general form right here. So if we call any cross-sectional area a of x, some function of x. Um, now generally, the revolution method, this cross section is always going to be a circle. Now of course, if you wanted to um, figure out the volume, should this cross sectional area not be a circle, you can totally go for it and use a different equation. However, at least for the calc A, B, and B, C exams, really this cross section is only going to be a circle. So um, the general, general, general form for the volume, so I'm going to call this gen right here, is going to be the volume will be equal to whatever integral you're, I mean, whatever 
basically the height component is going to be along the x-axis, whatever will correspond to an in interval, and that's the interval you integrate over. Um, so that integral, and you're integrating and the cross-sectional area times dx. But for this class, and in most kind of A, B, B, C classes, um, and this is really going to be the revolution method because you're revolving a function. If you can visualize revolving a function around um, an axis, it will look like uh, this. The, the integral from a to b times pi, and then r, where you would generally have the r in the equation for the area of a circle, it will be um, the function that you're revolving, f of x, squared dx, and that's the that's the volume using the revolution method. Now, there's another method in your book called the shell method for um, figuring out volumes like this, and there is no problem that you will encounter on the AP that you will not be able to use the revolution method for, and the revolution method is a lot easier to, to kind of visualize, so that's the only one I'm going to be t focusing on and teaching in this video series. But if you want to look at the shell method, feel free, your book describes it very well. And so, if, you, if you're having a tough time visualizing spinning a function around an axis, which is a little bit of a weird thing to visualize, I have some graphics from your book um, right here that you can take a gander at. Um, so this is the first one. We've got a function y equals root x. This root x, this y value, you can think of that as your r right there, and then p picture the cross sections, all these circles with different r's, and we ultimately, in order to get a volume that looks like this, and you can think of this as one of the cross sections, and this distance, that change of x, because we're integrating, that gets very, very, very small until they're basically just flat disks, and we need to add all those up. So if you think of that as your r, then the volume becomes the cross-sectional area, and that cross-sectional area is pi r squared, or pi m y squared, which is equal to pi x. Then, look, you get the integral of pi x dx, and then you integrate that, and you will get this volume. And this little sign means you're s rotating it about the x-axis, and this is vaguely what the solid will look like. It kind of looks like um, some sort of a cone. So that's, that's kind of how you have to be able to picture uh, spinning a function around an axis or an area that you get from integrating a function around an axis. Um, that's how you have to picture it when you solve these problems. So let's actually go try to solve one that is in your book right now. All right, so we're going to do number two from page 360 in your book, and um, what we what the question asks is to solve for the volume of the solid that is generated by rotating um, the equation y equals one minus x squared, which is this curve, between y equals zero, so that line, and x equals zero, and we're revolving it about the x-axis. So first, what we can do is we can call this height our radius, and that radius corresponds to, of course, f of x, which is, you can write that out, it's 1 minus x squared. So the cross-sectional area, a of x, that's going to equal pi r squared, so that's going to equal pi f of x squared, squared. And when we plug in for f of x, we get 1 minus x squared squared. So that's pi 1 minus x squared squared. So that is our cross-sectional area formula. Now, when we move this over to figure out the volume, um, basically, we just integrate this over um, the, the interval of the function. And this is going to be between 0 and 1, because 1 is where uh, the function crosses the x-axis and zero is where it crosses the y-axis. So we're actually going to integrate this on another page because we don't have too much space here. Alright, so here is the expression for the volume. And um, now what we can do 
is uh, we basically just need to expand this out and based on the properties of integrals we can put this pi on the outside of the integral so we'll get pi integrate between 0 and 1 um, x, negative x squared squared is going to be x to the fourth and minus 2x squared plus 1 and then all this times dx and now we can get the antiderivative here um, to do the integral that's going to turn into x to the fifth over 5 minus 2 thirds x to the third plus x between 0 and 1 and so when we put the 0 in all these are going to turn into 0 so we just need to plug in for the 1 that's going to be pi times 1 fifth minus 2 thirds plus 1 and now when we get everything and give it all a common denominator that will come out to 8 pi over 15 and so that is the volume of the solid generated by rotating that function about the x-axis. Now, what if we wanted to rotate it about the y-axis, around another axis? Is that possible? Yes, that is possible. So we wanted, that means would we, if we wanted to rotate it like that. And we can do that, but the first thing we need to do is we need to put everything in terms of y, and then basically use the same method as we did before. So right now we have y equals 1 minus x squared. We need to put this all in terms of y and we're still going to use the same constraints. We're still going to use the x-axis and the y-axis as our constraints. So we can get to isolate um, x, we get y minus 1 equals negative x squared and then bring the negative sign over and that's 1 minus y equals x squared and now we can take the square root of both sides and that'll give us root 1 minus y equals x. But there's a plus and minus here on this root. And so the plus, the, the, the positive version of that graph would be that curve, that side of the curve. And the negative would be this side of the curve. And since we have these constraints here, we can get rid of that negative, And we'll only use the positive root. So now our r is this right here. That's our r. And that r, and that r corresponds to x, and now x is a function of y. And so our cross-sectional area formula, if we're going to still, if we're going to be getting circles, here, our cross-sectional area, which is still pi r squared, now that turns into pi f of y squared, and so when we integrate, we're going to integrate still from 0 to 1, but we're just going to be integrating with respect to y using this function of y. So let's go back over to the other screen and do that. Alright, so here we have our expression for volume, and when we plug in um, the function of y into this, we get pi times root 1 minus y squared with respect to y. And now when we square that, we get rid of the root, and we can take the pi out, we get pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus y times dy. This is looking pretty easy to solve. Pi times that 1, when we integrate it, turns into a y. That y turns into a y squared over 2. And we got that from 0 to 1. And then that will be, when we plug in 1, it's 1 minus a half. Um, and the, the 0 goes away. And that 1 minus an, a half turns into a half. And so we get pi over 2. So we get different volumes when we revolve around different axes. But um, all it is is a matter of finding a function of uh, whatever axis you're revolving around. So if you're revolving around the y-axis, um, get a function of y. If you're revolving around the x-axis, get a function of x and integrate with respect to x. Now, I'm going to show you one more different kind of problem. Um, actually from your book here. Alright, so now we're going to do problem number 7 from page 360. And what this asks us to do is find the volume generated by when we rotate the solid, the, the volume of the solid generated by rotating the area between the graph of y equals x and y equals x cubed around the x-axis. So what we're doing is finding the solid that's generated when we rotate that little area
around this x-axis. And, and if you're having trouble fi kind of conceptualizing what that volume would look like, um, there's a picture right here from your book. That is what the volume looks like. It kind of looks like a, um, <laughs> it looks like a vase with like a hole taken out of the middle. Um, so when we go back to the graph, the first worry is, well, in the past, in the past two problems, what we've been doing is finding a radius that goes that touches the axis we're rotating, and then treating that radius as the radius of the cross-sectional area. But with this, we can't do that because the the radius doesn't extend all the way down to the x-axis. So how do we go about this? Well, in the same way that we kind of think of two different areas, sub subtracting one area from, from another when we're finding the area between two curves, we can do that when we're finding the volume generated by rotating the area between two curves in that we have two volumes. We have the volume generated by rotating f about the x-axis and the volume generated by rotating g around the x-axis. And the volume of g so V sub G is always going to be greater than the volume of F but just because G is greater than F on this interval up into the intersection point. So what we can do is we can subtract in order to find our final V we can subtract the volume generated by rotating F around we can subtract it away from the volume generated by rotating G so by doing this so we'll need to set up two integrals. And technically you could fit this all in one integral because there's only one interval of integration here. But for simplicity's sake and for clarity's sake, I'm just I'm going to set up two integrals so you can see that there are two different volumes. And we're going to do that on the other screen. So the first thing we're going to have to do is figure out that intersection point. And that's pretty easy. We set the two, we set f and g equal to one another. And we can see we got we divide by x on each side when is x squared equal to 1 when x is either plus or minus 1 but we're only dealing with the positive half of this of that equation so they intersect when x is 1 so that's going to be um, our region of integration for it's going to be from 0 to 1 um, so now we need to f figure out the volume generated by rotating f and we use our same equation as before or actually let's find g first. So volume g we're going to integrate from 0 to 1 and the radius is going to be g of x so we get pi g of x squared dx and we use x because we're revolving around the x-axis so that's going to be integral from 0 to 1 um, pi x squared dx and that's the volume of g. Now we'll find the volume of f and we're integrating from 0 to 1 pi f of x squared dx um, and we plug in for x cubed we get x to the sixth so that becomes pi x to the sixth dx and remember in this case g is greater than or equal to f over this interval so in order to find our final volume we subtract the volume of f from the volume of g. So let's do that. Let's write that here. And that will be from 0 to 1, g was pi x squared dx minus pi x to the sixth dx. Now we can start integ integrating. We can take out these pi's. So we get pi turns into an x cubed over 3 between 0 and 1 minus a pi and this turns into x to the 7th over 7 from 0 to 1 as well. This turns into pi over 3 minus pi over 7 and when we get a common denominator we will get 4 pi over 21 and that is the volume generated by roting, rotating that little bit of area around the x-axis. So that's volume, finding volume using the revolution method. Um, I hope that this was helpful. If you want to check out the shell method, feel free to do so, but um, I'll just remind you that everything on the AP you can get using this revolution method, and I think that this is the, the easier one to sort of visualize and conceptualize.